In this interview, I'm speaking to Professor Penny Endersby, the Chief Executive Officer of the UK's Met Office, who is in charge of one of the most important climate change modelling computers in the world. Penny takes us inside the climate model and reflects on the hard truths that the data outputs are telling us. It is worth listening to Penny talk us through the Earth System Simulator the UK has developed to navigate us through what is currently an undecided and uncertain future. Penny, thank you very much for taking the time today. I really appreciate you speaking to me. Not at all. Thanks for having me on. I'm going to start just by asking a question around the climate models itself. Um, I hear a lot of people in just about every interview with scientists, they always refer to the models. And can you talk about how you generate model outputs and where the data comes from for the Met Office model? We approach modelling the climate in numbers of different ways, but when the community talks about the model or the Met Office model, it really is referring to our physical models. So this is very much um, a model of the whole Earth system, the atmosphere, and it's based on dividing the globe up into cells as small as we can computationally cope with and generating what would be a digital twin of the Earth if it was at the moment, and then projecting that forward and backward in time. And for the weather model, we do that with incredible fidelity. So we, we're taking in 250 billion observations a day to take a picture of exactly everything we know about the Earth, the sea, the air, the land surface. And then we project that forward over a short period once. For climate, we have to go back much further and forward much further. So we don't have quite so many observations, but they're still based on real observations wherever we have them, historical observations if we have to go further back. Yeah. And then obviously when we project forward, we can also we change the atmospheric conditions. So we're putting different amounts of carbon dioxide or whatever in, in that atmosphere to see how that, how that would change rather than just looking at, at the atmosphere as it is today. I mean, that sounds enormous in terms of modeling the whole, the whole planet. Can I ask what have the big successes in climate modeling been, especially in this whole Earth scenario? Yeah, so I suppose the real big success is that we've been you know, projecting within the limits of, of the area we've declared correctly the global temperature rise back since the 70s now but in more recent times you're right to say it is it's those whole earth system elements that we um that we use we're beginning to put in not just the atmosphere but the ocean the land surface the sea ice the jet stream some of those details and we're beginning to be able to reflect the carbon and nitrogen cycle including drawing out what would happen um, you know, with different levels of tree planting or protection of peat bogs or whatever it is. So we'll be able, we're being able to look at some of those climate feedback loops now. That data, the things that you're seeing, especially when you project forward, I mean, there's never a, a more important time than now, I guess. Where does that data end up? I mean, I know it ends up at the UNFCCC and places like that, but where else? Is there, are there industries that use it, like policy makers, obviously? I think it depends a bit whether you're talking about the sort of global or the national level, because we have both a global and a national remit. So the, the most important thing we do with our, our global climate series is to feed that into the IPCC um, models. And we're, we're one of many, but we are one of their, you know, their, their most influential modelling centres. Um, um, other international organisations use it as well. So you, you might have seen in today's press the WMO looking at our seasonal decade or forecast, and we're the lead centre for that on their behalf. We do some work on behalf of the Foreign Office and DFID looking at particular regions of the globe where we're offering support tends to be more on the sort of shorter kind of decadal time scale rather than the centuries. So that's the kind of global yeah. mission. And then in much more detail, we influence the, the UK policymakers through our UK climate predictions, which we are able to do on much finer resolution, and really down to two kilometres around the UK, saying what you can expect to see over different periods. And that very, very much drives the both the adaptation and the mitigation policy here. This decade, I mean, this is kind of seems like a controversial decade in a way. I mean, there's a lot of people saying, oh, we've got to do everything in, 20, in 2020 for the outcomes in 2050 or 30 or whatever. What's the Met Office view? What's the Met Office sort of pushing in terms of you know, policy influence, if you like? Well, don't forget, we don't, we're not a policy making body. <laughs> so we are an advice and scientific body. We sure, provide the sure. science that helps the policymakers make that policy. But in that information that came out today, what we were talking about was the, the likelihood 
with the situation we're already in of seeing both months and individual years that will tip over the 1.5 C. That doesn't mean the whole climate average has reached 1.5 C, that will come later, but in all likelihood, you know, that's the very best we can expect and we're within touching distance of having emitted all the carbon for 1.5 C global average rise now. Notwithstanding that, I think my headline message to anybody is the faster we can undertake the mitigation, the better it will be. And if we can't hit 1.5, we still want to hit two and two is better than three and three is better than four. So we should try and, and it absolutely is, you know, the time for action is now it is urgent to do something. But the other side of that and our key messages around the adaptation, because you are going to see 1.5. We have not seen everything that 1.1C can throw at us yet, which is something people don't always appreciate. We've only been in our current climate regime for a very short time and we haven't seen all the extremes. If we could freeze it now, we would still see worse weather. That's actually something, I mean, it's, it's another question I had for you. When we look at the climate system and there's sort of us looking at it as lay people seeing the news or some outputs of the Arctic warming or... Um, fires in Aust Australia, you know, these sort of very tangible things. When you're looking in, inside the climate models and, and you're seeing potential outcomes of 1.1 degrees, how does that show to you in data or as an output? Well, again, it depends a little bit on on the locality. For the UK, we work at a high resolution. We simply can't afford computationally to do the level of detail we do for the UK all over the globe. And for the UK, we're already in a position where we can start to model future climate as future weather. So we really can see the kind of weather extremes you can expect with different amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere, the different emission pathways, different timelines, and we're able to, to project those. Um, for the global system, we're moving towards being able to do that, but we're very interested in things like the increase in frequencies of tropical cyclones and so on and that, that is starting to emerge but it's a bit more experimental and it isn't universally all over the globe um then the question everybody wants to know is for any of those events that you've just mentioned the, the wildfires the floods the peat wave in, in in 2018 in northern europe whatever it is mm -hmm. was this particular event attributable to anthropogenic climate change and that's always more difficult because our answers are statistical so the way we come at that is to run a thousand winters in pre-industrial carbon dioxide levels and a thousand winters with elevated carbon dioxide levels and see how often you see a particular event. Um, and then we can say, well, this thing that you might have seen once in 200 years in pre-industrial times, you're now going to see once in 50 years, which I think was roughly the frequency for the Australian wildfires as we are at the moment. And in the future, you're going to see them at once in 10 or once in once in five years, depending on the emissions pathway. But it's very hard to say this particular flood could never have happened before. But being able to, set, to give someone that warning that you're going to get this once every five or ten years. I mean, I, I know, for instance, the Australian wine industry is reeling from, from the impacts of the fires and they've got to grow back those vines and old vines. You know, there's a whole, I mean, it's so yes. deep. It's absolutely well, it's sobering and fascinating. Well, yes, and um, you might have seen also that we've had two two big um, papers out this week, but we had the one on the frequency of 40 centigrade in the UK out at the beginning of the week. Now, the UK has never seen 40 degrees C. Off the top of my head, our highest ever temperature was 38.7. Um, and we're saying that by 2100, if we stick to Paris emissions targets, we'll be seeing that, I think it was every 15 years. Um, if we go into a high emission scenario, we'll be seeing that every three years. So that's a, a completely different situation and it impacts everything from our crops to tropical diseases to our building stock to you know, heat stress and, and heat exhaustion, all of those things. Wow. Okay. You're talking about a lot of the capability. What are the biggest challenges for you at the moment with modelling data or where, where do you see yourself really trying to overcome obstacles? So there's still things where we would love to get to a convection permitting global climate model. So our weather model is convection permitting, which means that the cells that we model in are small enough to see individual um, weather systems, clouds, um, whatever, on that kind of fine scale. We are not yet in the position where we have the um, computer power to do that globally. 
we have made big strides in our recent modeling with the characterization of clouds, but clouds are just as tenuous and nebulous and, and changeable as they look <laughs> when yeah, you look at them. Yeah. And they are really hard to model well. And the, the way that they change in future climates, the climate prediction is very sensitive to. So we would still like to get a better handle on cloud modeling, and that would still reduce the amount of uncertainty we show. So there's those aspects there. And then there's some sort of more social aspects. So we've spent 30 years getting really good at modelling of what happens when humans change the climate. And we're just coming to the point where humans are really changing their behaviour as a result of climate change. So now we need to look at what happens when humans change their behaviour as a result of what the climate does, rather than the other way around. And that brings us into all kinds of social science modeling challenges that we didn't have before as we look at different mitigation pathways and what people might do and we can also help advise kind of back to your policy point you know are you better to plant more trees or to preserve peat bogs or work on different aspects of the options you have so real resilience and planning and that yes kind of you mentioned computer capability or power if you had unlimited resources could you build the, the sort of the computer you need that's probably not a question I've ever had posed to me before. I think what you're kind of asking me is, could you get to a deterministic model if you could perfectly represent um, the whole of the atmosphere and, and uh, fine enough? And we, th we think no. So you would never get to the point where you could eliminate uncertainty or have something that was completely predictable and get rid of the chaos that yeah. weather and climate inherently have in them. Um, but you can certainly improve. And you know, we've got big investment in the next generation supercomputer inbound and every time we do this we get closer but it also presents us with all kinds of other challenges to be ready for that and to capitalize on on that next level of computing capability okay the other thing you just mentioned was cloud cover and i, I think that's absolutely fascinating i was interviewing someone just recently about um this cold blob in the arctic and it was talking about uncertainty around how much cooling effect cloud has and there's a lot of talk around generating cloud cover in the arctic to try and increase the albedo climate but is, repair climate yes. repair yeah <laughs> but obviously this is where you come in with the modeling i imagine being able to do that must be to quite an a... extent i mean that kind of climate repair is a real last resort and my anxiety is always that people will hope that they can do that or generate the magic carbon dioxide sucking machine instead of mitigation now you know as well as or in addition to is, is great great to invest in and pursue but relying on it as a silver bullet and thinking we can go on burning carbon because we'll fix it later is a really risky strategy absolutely yeah. so where we do come in is on looking at the impact of these things so yes planting trees is good that's a good method of climate repair but it isn't good everywhere and if you if you expand the tiger into the tundra and lose snow cover and change the albedo downwards, you can actually have a, a negative effect. Um, and those are the kinds of things where we can we can get involved in the modeling and, and sort of um, try to characterize what the effect of these huge scale interventions would be before they happen. But you are a bit into one planet, one experiment. Yeah, okay. I I, I did find the, the whole cloud thing really, really interesting. Or seeding the oceans to let them um, take up more carbon dioxide uh, it might work but the, the but side you, effects are a bit nerve-wracking nerve but do you think um it seems that the atmospheric burden of carbon was very obscure to people over the last decade but now people are starting to realize how big the problem is that that's where you go you go to the sort of oh we need a solution so i know you know here's the solutions and it's going to be much more talked about and the, the debate will, will sort of... I suppose, I suppose the repair will be, but you, know, it, you still, you've got, you've got three options. You've got mitigation, burn less. You've got adaptation, prepare for the changes. Yeah. And then finally, you've got repair, reverse the damage we've done um, and sort of net negative things. And I think that comes in a, a wide range of, of flavours from um, entirely rational to uh, dis distinctly wild and wacky um, and we, we really only engage with it at the sort of most um, the, you know, the most conventional end at the moment okay it's not a core part of our mission can you tell us what you see as the next really important development in supercomputing and earth system modeling so i think there's there's two sides there's the things we do to the model and then there's the things we do with the model output and so the next generation or two of supercomputers are going to look very different from the ones we have at the moment. 
they will be more capable and faster and that will let us get into some of those finer grids and convection permitting, permitting models that we really want to do. On the other hand, our current codes probably won't run on the architectures that we expect in the future. So we have a massive programme along with um, other major centres to rewrite all our codes to be architecture independent and our unified model which for us runs our, our weather and our climate predictions, not everybody uses the same one, is three million lines of code. So it really is, it's a 10 year program to replace that with something that we're actually some several years down the track of already. Um, wow. So that, that's, that's, one, that's one thing. And the other side of that is being able to run larger ensembles and so on to give us better grip on uncertainty. But actually we're into such fast, fast data that we are, if you're familiar with the sort of bottom half and the top half of the chessboard where you have one grain of sand and then multiply it up, we are well into the top half. And the amount of data we produce is already so enormous that even the other real expert centres like the IPCC, it's quite hard to transfer it from us to them. We, we have to generate quite innovative data compression and data transport algorithms just to move it across so they can have it. And for other people, they, they're not going to be able to receive our data by us giving it and then picking out what they want. So we're going to have to be looking at all kinds of clever data science and data wrangling techniques and cloud storage for people to be able to pull what they want. And with that as well, we're certainly anticipating a greater use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in some limited areas within the model, but actually much more in how we then make sense of the day, make, make sense of the model outputs and convey the sweet spots to our, our users for where that where our data intersects with theirs. The output side of it sounds fascinating because I mean there's obviously a lot of visualization in there of, of how people can actually read it. How big a part of it is that? I mean, I, aside from just it, generating it. It's huge. It's pretty much I see them as two equal parts of our our national capability in weather and climate and one is our fantastic grip on the, the fundamental science but the other is we are genuinely world leading not just in, in weather and climate but in in big data and in in um, supercomputing just to be able to let us do what we do and those two things if they don't progress side by side and hand in hand get out of step with each other then we have fabulous world-breaking groundbreaking science that we can't actually turn into to products that help people make better decisions um, because it's just too unwieldy. So we really do move those two things side by side. And if we get a huge investment in a new supercomputer, we have to be just as alert to how we're going to take that and take the benefits from it and get it into other people's hands as we are into how we can change the model to run it, and make it more accurate. Being a world leader in this area, you know, this is a huge asset for the UK. How do you interface or do you interface with other supercomputers around the world, other models? Um, are there models that are more on the industry side that you might interface with or, or is it more public bodies? Or Well, we certainly interface um, with other big supercomputer users and particularly in the UK, we have this programme called Excalibur which is funded um, through UKRI by Bayes, which is looking at novel supercomputer, future, future, future supercomputers, not just for us, but for other sorts of simulation, um, like nuclear fusion and galaxies and microbial research and things as well. So um, we, do some, we do some sort of work on the, the cutting edge of supercomputing as a sort of national strategic program through that. We absolutely deal with the biggest big names in, in big tech. Weather and climate is an area that they all like to get involved in because we deal with data at a scale that lots of other people are not yet, but we all know on the, the trajectory that we're following and that we all will be. So presumably, you know, before you're old, you'll be carrying my supercomputer's worth of data around on your hip or whatever the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the future yeah. will be. And so we're a, we're a vet, not, not just that they, they're interested in it for the science and for the social good it can do, but they're also interested in it as a, as a use case where that will be then expanded to other things. I mean, just the idea that we can carry so much around with us. How, this is kind of to close on really, how important in terms of us understanding and, and responding to climate change, I mean, this feels like a navigational tool or something. I mean, how, how critical is it that we develop this further, that we really keep this research and development going? I think it's absolutely critical. So if you move into thinking about what the future could look like in terms of tipping points or whatever, there are many things that are still not completely understood 
that are going to be um, existential for humanity <laughs> in the end. So it's hard to think of anything that could be more important. And we all of us have an individual as well as a collective part to play in that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been really good and really fascinating to talk to you. So thanks for your time. No, thank you. Thank you too.